Once again, in the Jaws obsession, where we are here to share with you, prove to you, convince you, or remind you that Jaws is the greatest movie of all time. Thank you very much for returning for this episode 63 of the Jaws obsession, Polly's Printing. Yes, yes, the world's most famous police department secretary, Polly, will be in the spotlight for this episode 63. What clues into the history of the Amity Police Department and Chief Brody's time on the island does Polly bring to the table in the Jaws universe? Although her appearance is very brief in the movie Jaws, the civilian secretary of Chief Brody's office leaves much to discuss and analyze if we break down her exchange with the chief in the office on the morning of June 27th. It gives us a chance to clear up some possible misconceptions about this scene as well as the timeline of the events of Jaws. So Polly brings a lot to the table and we're going to get into that in a little bit. But first, what we have to do is we're going to have a special guest because shortly I will be leaving for England and we have a special event coming up. So we have one of the organizers for that event in England visiting the show with details on the event. I want to thank you for your time and listening to this broadcast. It's always great to have you here and to once again dive into the greatest movie of all time, Jaws. Okay, at this time, I'd like to welcome to the show Mr. Hayden Wheeler. I always envisioned the Jaws obsession as a vehicle to pull the Jaws fandom and Jaws community together, not just in the United States, but globally, around the world. Jaws obsession, as we know, is an American-based broadcast, and what we have now is we have Hayden, who is the first international guest to be on this show. I believe that Hayden is the personification of the original goal of the Jaws obsession, to bring all Jaws fans from around the world under one tent to bask in the glory that is the greatest movie of all time. So at this time, Mr. Hayden Wheeler, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? I'm doing fine, Ryan. Right? Yeah, great, great to be on the show, and thanks for asking me on. I mean, uh, it's a privilege to be on the uh, Jaws obsession podcast. Uh, absolutely. It's great to have you. You have been working overtime, night and day, with the time difference, getting the word out of the Jaws Obsession and the Book of Quint to those Jaws fans over there in the UK. I want to start with your obvious passion for Jaws. What's your history with the movie over the years, and how did you come across the Jaws Obsession broadcast? I'm sort of the first time round with Jaws. I saw Jaws in 1975 at the age of 11, when I went with my parents on uh, Boxing Day here right. in uh, 1975. And... Um, I saw it about eight times in a row in the end. I went with my, my parents used to sort of take me down to Bournemouth on a Saturday and take me down to the Bournemouth ABC. And they basically, they used to use it as a, 
a babysitting thing for me in some ways because I used to go and watch Jaws every Saturday, you know. So, I mean, <laughs> that was my <laughs> that was my Saturday viewing every Saturday for about eight weeks. I just went and saw Jaws. That sounds like paradise. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was great. I mean, we were talking back in the days where you could sort of sit in the cinema and watch it again and again and again and nobody threw you out, you know. Oh, you could just fantastic. You, you just, yeah, back then. But, you know, it was an A certificate, though, wasn't it? So yeah. it wasn't parental guidance. You could go in there... Because I, I can't remember too well, because obviously I'm 57, 58 now, and I, I sort of think, did I sit in there by myself, or did I sit in there with my mum or dad? I'm sure I sat in there by myself and watched it. Right. My father used to joke about it, uh, joke about it, actually. He was always telling friends how many times I watched it, and I knew the name of the dog, and it was like a running joke in our family. <laughs> but that was my that was my first you know, uh, experience watching Jaws the film, you know. And, I, yes. and, and then you had a resurgence when you discovered the Jaws Obsession broadcast? I came to that after I went to see the re-screening of it with the Spielberg 3D version. I went to see it in 2020, that was 22, wasn't it? Yeah, 2022. Last, last summer, yeah. And that was the first time I'd seen Jaws since I was 11 on the big screen again. I went and saw it and it took me right back to my childhood. Wow. I just fell in love with the film again. And wow. You know, I thought, what's out there now in the Jaws world? So I, I, I went and listened to a few BBC broadcasts on the Jaws, on the the, the film itself. Discovered your podcast, um, was hooked, um, Lion Sinker, I was in there. And um, it was such a good podcast. It just took me right back into that Jaws world. And it was so, it went through so many layers, your podcast. Well, you're still doing it, aren't you? But the pod, they just okay. pull you right in. You know, and then I went and made, got a model of the orca, and I listened to your podcast, and I was making the model, and then I went and bought another model, and I was still listening to the podcast. So yeah, I jumped <laughs> in with both feet. Basically. And we're glad you did because what you've done is you've established the Jaws OB UK over on Twitter, and you were able to be our connection into because there is a lot of British Jaws fans. Oh, definitely. Yeah, it's massive over here. I mean, it's massive everywhere, I think, isn't it, Jules? Yeah. But I mean, yeah, I mean, when I went to see it, when it was the reissue, 3D issue here, it was, um, you know, the cinema was three quarters full, you know. And I, I go to the cinema now to watch new films and you see four people in there. So definitely Jaws is still very popular, you know. Right. I mean, when, when people get a chance to see it on the big screen again, I think people, I've only seen two films doing that. I went to see Jaws in 3D, which, I, which was packed. We're well, not right. packed three quarters full with such. And then I went to see The Thing, Okay. Uh, this year, and that sold out. So, I mean, those films of that era, or a bit, it just they're just popular, and right. they, they stay with you, I think. I think they go across generations. You were able to create a pipeline into getting the word out about the Book of Quint and about what we're doing here in the Jaws Obsession. And without you, this July 1st meetup would not have been possible. I have to stress to the listeners, you were just a Jaws fan. You, you, you really liked what we were doing here in the Jaws Obsession, and you jumped all over it. You've been working around the clock July 1st. How did this grow from just a Jaws UK meetup into what we're, what I'm calling a novel celebration for Robert Shaw? Well, yeah, it was going to be a meetup. Correct. It was just going to be some, me and some Jaws OB fans on this side of the, uh, of the pond as such. And, uh -huh. Huh? And then you, yourself, um, decided, you said, right, I'm coming over to join you. And this, <laughs> that's when it turned into an event. And that you, great, it did. I mean, it's fantastic you're coming over, Brian. I'm just really, oh, cool. really pleased. You know, and it's going to be in West Norton where Robert Shaw was born. And it, it, there's so many connections there. With Quint, Robert Shaw, you coming over with the Book of Quint, it just seems like the perfect place to be, you know, on July the 1st. Yes, yes. The venue is going to be the Robert Shaw Weatherspoon Pub in the Greater Manchester area, 3440 Market Street, on July 1st at 11 a.m. Yeah, I mean, there's Chris, obviously, who, wins, who uh, runs the West Alton um, Community Network. I mean, he's been a star. I mean, doing all the legwork up there in West Alton. You know, sort of. Um, Adam's been great from the Robert Shaw. They've all been so open to the event. They just, you know, it was just been fantastic dealing with these people. It's been a joy. I mean, I, you know, like you coming over, Ryan, and then the event itself turned into what it is working with these people has been would have been a really good experience. Oh, yeah, we've got Colin doing the reading as well. I must mention Colin, and we've got the historical society turning up. And you know, because I've spoke to you via WhatsApp, the, the actual school representative actually actually lives 
in Robert Shaw's house. So that's that's kind of this, strange, but this, that, that's great. <laughs> this is fantastic. There's so many Robert Shaw house. connections across the board. You're saying, so the Book of Quint is being accepted by West Houghton in many ways. We're having a historical society show up, and you're saying that the school representatives that are going to also be accepting the book into school libraries over there? Yes. I saw, yeah, well, I've been in contact with Chris. The library is taking it in, so you can get a copy to read for... Uh, well, the first free copy to read in the UK, really, yes. at the library in West Alton. Yeah. And the school's going to have a copy. And, yeah, so it's the first public free access to the book, uh, the Book of Quint, yeah. in the Yes, in the world. It's exciting. I'm traveling over. We're gonna, we, have a, we have a dozen books that we're going to be bringing over, and these are going to be divvied out in certain ways, shapes, and forms. The symbolism, first publicly available set of books, the symbolism being in the yeah. home, hometown of Robert Shaw, it's just, to me, it's just, it's a great little chapter in this arc, in the, the journey of the Book of Quint. What do you think? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's so fitting. I mean, it makes perfect sense, really, when you think about it. You know, where would you, Quint is Robert Shaw, you know, mm -hmm. and where where better to to be in the Robert Shaw, the pub itself, than in the Robert Shaw. Right. With, in his birthplace, in the town of West Alton. Uh, it's just, yeah, and it just makes, it's, it makes sense. It's very exciting. It's very exciting. I'm excited to actually go over there. Can't wait to see the area. So this is, uh, once again, it's it's 3440 Market Street, West Houghton in the Greater Manchester. It's the Robert Shaw Weatherspoon Pub. It's July 1st. And there's an Eventbrite link that we're going to have on the description of this broadcast as well as over at JawsOB.com. Let's talk about the big the big part of this event. Three books are going to go to <laughs> lucky winners of the raffle drawing. How much are tickets, and what is the Shark Research Charity that will be benefiting from the raffle tickets being sold? The charity, well, the organization is the Shark Hub, which is part of the Anglin Trust, and it will be the Baskin Shark Scotland. It's just that, Baskin Shark Scotland. Again, the tickets are one pound. And you'll be pleased to know we actually we actually have a yellow barrel to um, put the tickets in to shake them up. Oh, that's fantastic! And take the tickets up. How about that? Yeah, we, that's we, right. We've got we, it. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> this is great. This is great. We got a yellow barrel for the tickets to shake up. This is great. If you're a Jaws fan in the UK or anywhere over, and you can get over there, this is going to be a heck of an event. This is going to be very. And also, we do have an actor. That will be, is he an actor that will be reading from the book? Yeah, a, a chap called Colin. Um, okay. Yes, I think he's an actor. I mean, when I was speaking to Chris, he said he could just dress for part. So, yes, I'd imagine he's an actor, narrator, but he's going to be doing the reading. Then we have the raffle. And I think then we're going to walk down and look at the plaque, which is on the town hall. Chris has been talking about we can go around the corner and look where Robert Shaw was born, the house he was born at, because it's around wow. the corner. We're going to get to see the house yeah, where Robert that, Shaw was born. Yeah, no, I just sort of think, like I said, the representative from the school actually lives in Robert Shaw's house. That's, what would have been Robert Shaw's house. Right. So that, yeah, so there's a, it's a, it's a kind of synchronicity to all. There's you know, a lot of, of historical, there's historical significance, historical location to this event. That's wonderful. And, and just to be able to read a few chapters from the book in a public setting with Jaws fans there, we're going to have a lot of fun. This is going to be this is going to be a yeah. lot of fun, and it couldn't have been possible without you. I, once again, I want to say thank you for all the work that you did. As you say, a lot of plates have been spinning, keeping a lot of plates spinning at the same time. Yeah, yeah, but it's not just me. I mean, obviously, uh, the, the, you know, Chris has been great, Adam has been great, Colin has yep. been great, you've been great. It's been we've made it all happen together. Really, sure. it's not just me. I mean, I had the initial idea, but. You, you know, you need people around you to make the idea flow. So, yeah, it's not just me. It's everybody, Fantastic. really. You know, I mean, you were the big thing coming over, Ryan. I mean, once you once you were coming over, it's um, it's, it's something else. And, I mean, you had the ideas with the Book of Quint itself going into the library. So, mm -hmm. I mean, the, the fantastic stuff. It's just really good. It made it, it made it into a really good event and still be a good event. Oh, that's excellent. Excellent to know. I can't wait. I'm looking forward to it. We're looking forward to it. Some last minute thoughts here. Let's just talk about legacy of Robert Shaw. Do you see the book mm. of Quint advancing okay. the legacy of Robert Shaw? Yes, definitely. I mean, yeah, it's, it, Quint is Robert Shaw. I mean, yeah. You're, you're perfectly right. R Quint is Robert Shaw. Robert Shaw is Quint. And if we get to know a little bit of a backstory to Quint, we actually get to know Robert Shaw a little bit better. I mean, you, you've taken it. You, you haven't produced a book about Robert Shaw. You've produced it about Quint. Who was played by Robert Shaw? It's it's, it's, it's actually another leg. It's not actually another level in some ways. You know what I mean? You could. You right. could it's not like a biography of Robert Shaw. You've extended the character, yeah, and tied up all the loose ends with the character, which are in the film. In in the book of Quint is 
Yeah, there's a lot of Robert Shaw in Quint. You right. can, it's definitely, that's definitely true. You know, I mean, you can just see the dialogue, the throwaway lines, the lines he came out with, the speech itself. I mean, that's all Robert Shaw. Yeah. That's all in the Book of Quint. You sort of get, you know, you get the backstory of that in the Book of Quint. You've been a longtime Book of Quint reader. And then I, obviously I see your passion. And uh, I, I think we're all on the same page here that we really need to give the UK and Europe need to have access to the Book of Quint. Obviously, shipping from the States can be costly. So we really need a UK publisher to step up and look at the Book of Quint's direction. And that's why I think this event might do the trick if that happens. I just want it's to thank simmering, you. Ryan. It's simmering. Yeah, it's, it's simmering there. It's going to happen. It's, it's uh, you know, it's waiting to go. Yes, yes. <laughs> it's at the starting block. It's, it's simmering there to be picked up, and it's definitely going to get picked up at some stage because it's such a great book. I've, I've read it, and like I've said to you before, you know, it's a great book, a standalone book. It's a book you can enter if you're a massive Jaws fan. You know all the, the lines from Jaws. Yep. If you know a bit about Jaws, it, it works on all the levels as a book, and it, it stands alone in, in its own right. Fantastic. Thank you. Wow. See, see, that's fantastic. And that's what if hopefully everyone that comes to the event, they're going to be able to flip through the book because the, there's going to be some books there at the uh, the Robert Shaw Weatherspoon Pub that are going to stay there. So people will be able to take a trip up and they'll be able to flip through the book and read what, whatever that, you know, couple chapters or whatever they want. And they'll be able to see that this is this is real. Like you said, it's simmering. It's ready to boil over that there's an energy here to feel this energy. There's an energy going that um, it's hard to verbalize, but it's there. Yeah, yeah, it's a whole network. It's a whole network working away in the background with the book of Quint, you know. Yeah. And once it's in the library, you know, there's other libraries that want the book. I know there's other libraries that yeah. want the book. I've, I've you know, I, I, I know there are. I mean, I can't, and I can't say anything, but I know yeah. <laughs> people have asked about the book being in the library. <laughs> so, I mean, so, you know, it's, it's a great, it's going to be in the library in West Horton. I mean, that's, that's just really special, you know, really exciting, Ryan. Yeah, yeah. definitely. I, and, and, and I'm telling you, I know this wasn't a one-man operation, but I'm going to have to always say thank you to Hayden Wheeler for striking the match that lit the fuse to get this whole process going. It was you and the Jaws Obsession UK and everything that you did. I want to really thank you, but uh, that you, you, did, you were the, the match striker on this, and I got to thank you a lot. <laughs> Uh, could you please let the I'll audience? You, you know. Yeah, no problem. Could you please let the audience know <laughs> where to follow Jaws OB UK and how to get in contact with you if they need to? Yeah, well, we have a Jaws OB UK Facebook page, which is just titled that. We have we have a Jaws OB UK on Twitter. Uh -huh. uh, that's the best way to get in contact with me because obviously you can message me direct message me via Facebook and Twitter. Yeah, with what we're doing in the UK. I mean, you know, next let's be in Spain or let's go, you know, let's be somewhere else after this. You yeah, know? let's it's, go. Let's go. Let's go. It's Every cost country. You a fortune in the air. Yeah, it's going to cost you a fortune in air tickets, Ryan. But the tour. That's it's it. Yeah, the tour. tour. Let's do a global <laughs> tour. That's great. Thank you so much, Hayden. Thank, thank you so much for coming on the Jaws Obsession, letting everybody know I'm going to be seeing you in uh, the Greater Manchester yes. area. It's going to be exciting. Fantastic. It okay. is, it definitely. Be there. If you like Jaws, if you like the Book of Quinn, if you want to expand in the Jaws universe, go to the uh, July the 1st of Robert Shaw in West Houghton. Absolutely. West Houghton. <laughs> West Houghton. Yes, sir. At 11, yeah. at 11 a.m. See you there. I'll see you there. Yeah. Right, Mom. Cheers. What a special member of the Jaws obsession, Hayden Wheeler, and, and everyone else out there that's working to make this event possible. Hayden also wants to thank Andy Curry for tying us into the Basking Shark Scotland organization. And we also want to have a big thank you to Kimberly, the librarian in Cumbria, who's doing promotional work for the event on July 1st. Thank you very much, Kimberly. It will be exciting to meet you there on July 1st. I was informed that we have a yellow barrel that will be holding the raffle tickets. You can see on our show notes over at Telegram channel at Jaws OB, made to look like one of Quint's famous yellow barrels will be mixing up the raffle tickets and that's where there will be the drawing for the three lucky winners for the book of quint but those raffle tickets will be generating funds for these two organizations the first organization is the angling trust anglingtrust.net we will have the link for them in our show notes as well as in the description of this broadcast the angling trust is the single organization to represent all game course and sea anglers and angling in england they lobby government, 
campaign on environmental and angling issues and run national and international competitions. They fight pollution, commercial, overfishing at sea, overabstraction, poaching, unlawful navigation, local bans, and a host of other threats to angling. And recently what they were, one of the projects that they are working on is protecting endangered sharks off the UK shores. So that's some of the work that the Angling Trust does on a daily basis in regards to protecting the oceans and for shark research. The other organization is the Basking Shark Scotland, baskingsharkscotland.co.uk. That link will also be in the description of this broadcast as well as the our show notes. Very interesting work this organization does. Apparently in May, June, and July, the migration patterns of basking sharks bring them close to Scotland on the west coast of Scotland I'm going through their site. The basking sh- that basking sharks migrate from the subtropics uh, at this time to coincide with the spring plankton bloom. What the Basking Shark Scotland organization does is they offer basking shark tours to go experience basking sharks as the migration brings them close. But one other thing is they have basking shark research expeditions that they hold. So they're highlighting basking sharks arriving in the outer islands at historic record levels. And it says here, we are particularly keen to try and genetic sample these sharks to try and discover more about them and the relation or not to our summer basking sharks. So it's a low impact, small group guided by marine biologists. If you visit their website, you can actually go with them on these expeditions and actually see basking sharks, which which are which is a fantastic that the basking shark is what's fantastic about it, that the proportions really do resemble the Bruce the shark in Jaws. If you look at the, uh, the 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 massive dorsal fin for the animatronic shark that's used in Jaws, there are a lot of similarities, especially that one sweeping scene where the shark is coming across when they first, when Hooper, Brody, and Quint first see the great white in Jaws. That sweeping scene where the shark swims by the orca. It looks like a basking shark from above. I've never seen a basking shark myself in the wild, but anytime I do see one on these documentaries, I always do think of Bruce the shark when I see the proportions of a basking shark. You know, the massive proportions, the large tail, the wide head, the big gills. It's very Bruce the shark. Wonderful to see that there's an actual organization that actually has basking sharks. They track their migration patterns. Anybody can actually experience these animals now. Wonderful to see these two organizations and it is an honor to be able to raise funds for them. So please, if you are in the area or if you're in the UK, if you come down on July 1st, come down to the Robert Shaw Weatherspoon Pub All ticket proceeds will be going to these two organizations, and that is exciting to see. What are the odds that here we are, JAWS just had its 48th year anniversary, so here we are, 48 years since JAWS opened, uh, that Quint is going to be raising money to help sharks. What a nice circle of life that is, with the Book of Quint making that happen. Uh, With every new day, there is a, a new edition or a new branch of excitement about this July 1st event. So I can't wait to see everybody there. So with that, let's pivot to the second half of this episode, Polly's printing. Let's talk about Polly. So the topic of Polly was brought up in a recent email I received from listener Rob. Uh, Rob wrote in, he said, hello there, young feller. I just want to say that I'm ecstatic about what you are doing. I read the first chapter of the book of Quint and it's awesome. I am so upset. I am late to this party and I cannot wait until I can obtain the entire book. I am a member of several Jaws fan groups on social media and have informed every one of them about your podcast and book and everything you are doing to keep Jaws alive for all of us fans. I would like to contribute in any way I can. I apologize if any questions I ask were covered in earlier podcast episodes as I am trying to catch up. Many questions get asked on social media about a number of things left unexplained in the best movie ever made, and I always refer them to your podcast. I have enjoyed every one of them and can't wait for more. I will be watching Jaws again for around my 300th time, and I see it through a new scope now thanks to you. Can we talk about how incredibly fast Polly knew it was the medical examiner on the phone? She handed the phone to the chief in under half a second. And then he has, an, <laughs> then he has a question, Book of Polly? So <laughs> uh, that was from, uh, uh, thank you very, and he says, thank you again, and I will continue to spread the word about your work for well and ado, sir. Rob O'Brien from Pittsburgh, PA. <laughs> so, so Rob hints at a book of Polly. 
<laughs> that's great. And uh, great email. And that's what started me thinking about, well, we'll have to move the topic of Polly up the list. So that's what brought about this idea for episode 63 to be about Polly the secretary. So thank you very much, Rob, for writing in with that question. And I'm going to try to answer that in this episode. And thank you very much for those great kind words about the Jaws obsession and what uh, what we are doing here. It's great to see Rob actively working the pavement with the several Jaws fan groups on social media. Uh, Rob is doing his part over there in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Thank you, Rob. Now, who is Polly? Everybody, if uh, we all know Polly. Well, you're up awful early. Is the chief in there? Yes, that is Polly, the secretary who walks into the fray as uh, in Jaws. That's her first appearance comes at exactly nine minutes into the movie. We are introduced to the secretary who seems to have a handle on all the business relationships and the business problems, um, the administrative side to the very new Amity Police Department. At least that's how I'm seeing it. And we're going to get into clues that tell us that the Amity Police Department is not, doesn't have that deep of a history here. Before we get into that, let's go to who was the actress who played Polly. The wonderful actress that played Polly, who's so dear to the Jaws community, the Jaws fan community, was Peggy Scott. Miss Peggy Scott was born on the 21st of January, 1905 in Massachusetts. She was a local actress and she passed away on the 1st of June in 1994 at the age of 89. So in 1974, when she filmed Jaws, she would have been 69 years old here in the movie. I'm going to refer to Jaws Memories of Martha's Vineyard by uh, Matt Taylor. I can't stress enough about this book. I do reference this book a lot, along with Carl Gottlieb's The Jaws Log and Edith Blake's on location on Martha's Vineyard, the making of the movie Jaws. But this book right here, if everyone, uh, Jaws Memories from Martha's Vineyard by Matt Taylor, is one of those books that you really, we really can't find. We don't have a reference on some of these side characters and personalities that played these bit roles in Jaws. And Matt Taylor actually has a little segment on Peggy Scott, who played Polly. This is just valuable, valuable information just to bring us closer to these characters if you know the actors and actresses behind these characters. Uh, Matt Taylor interviewed Sherry Rhodes, who was the casting director for Jaws, and she had some comments to say. She said, quote, Peggy Scott was an island woman we cast as Brody's secretary, Polly. She was just wonderful, probably one of our greatest local finds. She had performed in local theater forever, so she could act, but there was certainly nothing Hollywood about her. She was on set for maybe two hours, then off to the grocery store or to tend to her garden. I don't think she gave Bean in the movie a second thought. Much like a lot of the older Islanders we cast, they could have cared less about the movie business, and so landing these parts just didn't mean to them what it would to a trained actor. After Jaws was released, people called me for years wanting to use Peggy in their movies, but I don't think she ever acted again. And that's Sherry Rhodes talking about Peggy Scott. Another crew member, Ginny Poole, is quoted as saying, when Peggy, Scott, when Peggy Scott arrived at production headquarters to audition as secretary to Roy Scheider, assistant casting director Janice Hull and I sent her upstairs to meet with Spielberg without doing any kind of preliminary audition. She was gone for a half hour, then appeared at the top of the stairs and said, I got the part. Sherry Rhodes looked at me and said, Stephen never does this. But this time he did because he knew Peggy was perfect for the role. So here you have Peggy Scott. In a half hour, she just goes in and just nails down the lines in front of Steven Spielberg and comes out with the role. So she was meant to be in this role. This, this, and, and as we've talked in other episodes, that Spielberg was very in tune to what he was seeing around Martha's Vineyard, around Edgartown and the actor that the local people, the local flavor that he was getting into that movie. And that was going to be the, uh, that, that was going to leave a very unique fingerprint on the screen. That is something that you can't find in Hollywood that you can't find if you shot this in another location. It's part of the magic of Jaws is that that's this, uh, that Peggy Scott was one of those. And you can also talk about Herschel West. You can talk about all these, even Pip at the dog that these were all characters that were a product of Jaws filming at that place and time. 
So now that we know about Peggy Scott, let's go into the Jaws universe. and Let's talk about Polly. Polly is the secretary, obviously a well-seasoned member, islander, a well-seasoned islander, someone who has been on this island for quite a while and is someone who's probably been involved with the goings-on in the Amity town for quite a while. So at 8 minutes and 59 seconds, right around the 9-minute mark, we have... We, we, are, we cut from the beach and the discovery of the remains of Chrissy Watkins. And we are now inside the Amity Police Department. We have the, uh, the young man, Cassidy, sitting on the left side of the screen. We have Deputy Hendricks sitting on the right. They're facing the camera and in walks Polly, the secretary. So Cassidy and Hendricks, they're both holding glasses. You can see Hendricks drops a Alka-Seltzer tablet into the glass. Um, they have upset stomachs because they have already uh, been involved with the recovery of the remains of Chrissy Watkins, so they have upset stomachs. And in walks Polly. Well, you're up awful early. Is the chief in there? All right, so first thing we have to notice. Well, you're up awful early. Is the chief in there? Polly walks in with a pad of paper and a pencil. Now, clearly, she is not just getting to work. I don't think she's the type of lady that travels to and from her house with a pad of paper and a pencil. Now, we have to look at the official JAWS timeline. If you look back at our calendar that we created for episode 16, the official JAWS movie timeline, that JAWS takes place over 12 calendar days using specific benchmarks that we see inside the movie JAWS, um, there's an entire episode that shows how uh, how this was constructed. But we do know that the Chrissy attack occurred on the 27th. That's the 27th of June. That's a Friday, okay? So this is Friday morning. But what happens is, is that we have to look at exactly what time is are we actually introduced to Polly. It's easy to make the misconception that she is just getting to work, and that line, you're up awful early, is that she's seen... Uh, Hendrix, like she's usually the first one there and you're up awful early. So we have to deconstruct this and we have to deconstruct this by saying that Chrissy Watkins is attacked somewhere between 5 and 5.30 a.m. on that Friday morning. We know this from the sun rising that we she enters in. We were, were introduced to Chrissy Watkins at night, but it's actually kind of, it, it, what's happening is that it's a very early dawn is that you have the sun, the, the you have the, the, the full moon that's lighting the water, but as she gets up and she turns around. I can swim. Just can't walk or dress myself. Yeah, so as Cassidy's <laughs> struggling on the beach there, we see something coming up. That's the sun is coming up behind him. And then. Come on in the water. Take it easy. Take it easy. So what, what we're looking at is that's dawn, and uh, when I checked the records for sunrise, sunrise was between 5 and 5.30 uh, a.m. back on June 27, 1974. It's safe to say that that's the time that she is attacked by the great white shark. So Chief Brody at home, when he's getting up, he gets the phone call, and then he's at the beach for the discovery of Chrissy Watkins. That has to be between 7 and 7.30 that uh, Cassidy would have reported this to Hendricks. Now, what Hendricks is, is he is the night deputy. So he works overnights. So that's why he was able to get the call from Cassidy. He calls the chief. He's over there combing the beach with chief, and he discovers the remains of Chrissy. You here for the summer? Come on. So that's a tired, worked all night, and now he is discovering the remains of Chrissy Watkins, a very tired deputy, Leonard Hendricks, a wonderful performance by Jeffrey Kramer that uh, sits with us all. And that is what's going on, is that he is at the end of his shift, and now he's held over. So that would take place around 7 to 7.30 a.m. is the discovery. So now when you fast forward, when you get all the way back... Well, you're up awful early. What Polly is assuming is that 
Deputy Hendricks is up awful early in that he's usually sleeping by now. He doesn't usually get to work until maybe four or five or sometime in the afternoon. And then she says, you're up awful early, that he's never in the office that early. And now what we're looking at, though, is that this is about 10, between 10 and 11 a.m. It has to be, because then you would have the, the, the recovery of the remains, the medical examiner, would have had to come out there, the recovery of the remains, the photographs, uh, the investigation, all that, uh, all that, um, all the photographs and the collection of the remains would have taken place. That's about that. That would have to be about in, in, in many ways, that's anywhere from two to three hours. OK, so that's why they're now back at the office at 10, between 10 and 11 a.m. And so Polly was already in the office. So she already showed up to work at about seven or eight a.m. Now she stepped out, so she's coming back. So she's coming back into the office now. So this is not her first time in the office. She's actually, and this is not her first time getting to work on that Friday morning. She actually is now coming back to the office to talk to Chief about some developments. So I do believe is that she's already heard about this. This is not a shock to her. See, some people, uh, some people speculate that it's very, uh, very callous of Polly to walk right in and uh, not talk about well, what's going on. Why is there a medical examiner calling you? She has her own docket of items that she's trying to do, that she's trying to take care of on the administrative side of things while the police is handling what just happened. This is not her first time in the office. This is her returning to the office. So that's one note that we have to actually look around is what time is this? This is between 10 and 11 a.m. Um, on the morning of Friday the 27th. And Polly showing up to work is, it, it shows me that it's also Friday. It's Friday, it's not a Saturday. I remember one of the details was how did we, how did we figure out that Chrissy was killed on the Friday and not the Saturday? There are a number of factors that we got into that with, uh, with episode 16, but one of them is just Polly showing up to work is that that would be a Friday. She doesn't show to work uh, up to work on a Saturday. She's a Monday through Friday gal. That's what the administrative side would do, Monday through Friday in the government office. So this got to be a Friday morning. Also, the, the people that are bustling around town, it seems like a Friday morning. It does not seem like it is a uh, weekend, uh, a Saturday morning. There seems to be a lot of businesses and all that stuff that's prepar they're preparing for the tourist season to start up. So it, everything just tells me it's Friday. So that's why uh, Friday the 27th is the most logical choice of what day of the week this is. Because as we know from the sign that Alex Kittner is attacked and killed on the 29th, which is a Sunday uh, that we see later on. That's one line that we can do. Polly is already giving us clues into this Jaws universe. Let's continue forward and let's listen to Polly's interaction with Chief. Well, Chief! What have you got on? Polly, if this new filing system is going to work, you've got to keep that outdated stuff off my desk. Just the pending, all right? Yes, Chief. Now, we got a bunch of calls about that karate school. It seems that the nine-year-olds from the school have been karate the picket fences. Okay. There's a lot to unpack here. There's a lot to unpack here. She says, uh, she walks in and she says, Chief, what have you got on? Well, Chief, what have you got on? Polly, if this... And she's staring right at the Brody shoulder towel. Now, we have yet to find an answer to what the Brody shoulder towel is. Um, that's one of the great mysteries of Jaws and uh, that, we, that we had a whole episode on. That was um, Jaws Obsession Episode 8, the mystery of the Brody shoulder towel. And one of these days, we're going to get a definitive answer. But I had some theories on what that towel indicates. And that uh, Polly is, uh, is surprised. She says, what have you got on to this towel? That And she's obviously staring right at the Brody shoulder towel. So does Polly know about the Chrissy Watkins death? I think she does, but she doesn't know the extent of it. I think that there was a, that she knows that there was a missing that there was a missing uh, persons report. And I think she knows that remains were recovered, but she doesn't know the extent of what these remains were. She doesn't know the horrific damage as of yet. So when she's seen the Brody shoulder towel, this is all, this is indicating that there's something new going on. And that was her first thing that she mentions when she walks in the room. 
Now, what Brody says is he says... New filing system is going to work. You've got to keep that outdated stuff off my desk. Just the pending, all right? Yes, Chief. So, new filing system. Now, there's two ways we can take this. It's either Brody has a new filing system and the old one was canned, that he got rid of an old filing system and he's has a new filing system, or is it a new filing system that as in there never was a filing system, okay? And that this is something brand new that he has brought with him. Now, I am under the assumption that this whole exchange, this exchange between new filing system, if this new filing system is going to work, you have to keep that outdated stuff off my desk, okay? So one of the aspects, the history of Amity Island that I worked into the Book of Quint is that the... The Amity Police Department was very, it it was almost, it was part-time. One of the words that's used is constable. The definition of a constable is a public officer, usually of a town or township, responsible for keeping the peace and for minor judicial duties. In my experience working on Long Island, when I was in the Coast Guard, we would coordinate with local police department at times. And some of these small towns that were on the Great South Bay that were down the island, as in uh, along Jones Beach or Fire Island, going all the way out to uh, the Hamptons, there are small towns that are isolated on islands that you can only get to through uh, by means of a boat. Um, You can't even drive there. So uh, they don't have their own police departments per se. They don't ha- they're not big enough to have the funding for a police department. So what they have is they have a local constable who is uh, somewhat of a public appointed officer that's in charge of keeping the peace. But if something serious happens, they have to call in the local sheriff from uh, Suffolk County Marine Bureau has to send a sheriff over. And what they do is they will take um, they have these uh, at the time they had, I think they were Ford Broncos and just like Brody's Chevy Blazer. What they would do is they would they would drive down the beach, so they would take the road as far as they could, and then they would go right on the beach, and they would drive down the beach to these isolated towns. And uh, if there was a serious uh, incident that needed police attention, so the 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 narrative that I have been working on in uh, with the Book of Quint is establishing that Amity was at an isolated island that did not have a permanent police department up until the arrival of Chief Brody in that summer of 1974. At the time, it was just night deputy or part-time deputy, and they would send as a constable in a, in a constable position that really did not have police power, just a keeper of the peace, and that's the way the five selectmen wanted to keep things. It's just that as Amity grew and as Mayor Vaughn wanted to grow the island and establish a larger population and a larger tourist industry, in order to get that funding from the state, in order to get those different avenues started, he was told he had to establish, to meet population levels, growth levels, he had to establish a permanent police department, an Amity Police Department. So that's where the selectmen would then have hired Chief Brody as the brand new chief of police. The clues here show that there never was a police chief before Brody, that the, that this police department is brand new, that it was just, this might even be a brand new office. And I'm going to, and then there is a clue that makes me think that this is a brand new office that was set up, that Hendricks up until maybe a, the year before, the year, a year or two before that Hendricks is brand new. Hendricks, Deputy Hendricks, that he is now a deputy, but before he was just the constable. And before that, it was if there was anything serious needed, the the local police department that was established in Nantucket would send an officer over to handle whatever situation happened. That's the way I have steered events from the Book of Quint, which made most sense because of this poly scene, because of the poly interaction, that I don't think Chief Brody would have came in and thrown, if there was a prior chief or a prior police department, I don't think Chief Brody would have come in within a week's time because we're also looking at Chief Brody hasn't been 
on the job much more than a week or two weeks at this point. I know we're getting we're we're, we're splitting away from Polly a little bit. This is actually we're going to have we're going to need to do our own episode about the Amity Police Department because I think I can actually uh, we, we there are a lot more details to talk about later on about that. But these are the kind of clues that Polly brings to the table that shows us that Am- the Amity Police Department is just being established here for the summer of 74 because Mayor Vaughn and the selectmen have big plans for Amity, and that's why they needed to establish this. But because they have somewhat of a control of the island and they want to keep things under their watchful eye and they want to keep uh, keep their own power over the island. They wanted a green sheriff, someone who's not used to island life, someone who doesn't even like the water. It makes sense why they would want to hire an inexperienced, a, a, a nautically inexperienced chief of police such as Brody. Fascinating stuff here. Polly, if this new filing system is going to work, you've got to keep that outdated stuff off my desk. Just the pending, all right? Yes, chief. Uh, this would be outdated stuff that is not in the official capacity that Chief Brody is starting now, which is an actual police department. That's what he's talking about here. And it's very possible that Polly was at the administrative building. She was working over in the town hall, and they moved her over here. It's very interesting. Is is it possible that that double take that she does that Cassidy is sitting at Polly's desk in the office. We do not see, we don't really have a great establishing shot of the office, but, and we do know that this was the, um, that this, this set that they're in right now, this was the Jaws production offices on Martha's Vineyard. This is where all the producers would work out of uh, answer phones and anything that happened with the production was out of this office. So this doubled now as the Amity police department. So we really don't have the a look around the office because there's probably all sorts of storyboards from Joe Alves and ev- all sorts of notes that are on the walls around us, and we don't have a look. But is it possible that Cassidy is sitting at Polly's desk in her chair? That's why she does that double take on him when she walks into the office. Well, you're up awful early. <laughs> the chief in there? Yeah, it, it's it's quite possible she does. Well, chief. It's not a it's not quite a double take, but she has a very disturbed look as she looks over at Cassie, like who's sitting at my desk? So that's pro- probably what's going on is that's the receptionist area, and then she's walking into chief's office. What have you got on? Holly, if this new filing system is going to work, you've got to keep that outdated stuff off my desk. Just the pending, all right? Yes, chief. And also, we have to look at other clues about how long were the Brodies really on the island. So if if Martin Brody wakes up in the morning and he's realizing the sun is shining into the room. How come the sun didn't used to shine right here? About the house in the fall. This is summer. This conversation, this is this would have been late June. The sun is actually shining in this window now, but it doesn't automatically happen. This sun would have been peeking and peeking through the window as the days go on. So for Martin Brody to say this now, that tells me that he's only been on the island maybe a week to two weeks tops, that they just moved in. That they just he just started working on the job. They just started establishing this office for the Amity Police Department. Because this conversation, he would have said something about this sun earlier. He would have said something uh, it, it, because that sun would have been shining through that window two, three days ago. Because this is June twenty seventh, so we're on the so this is June twenty seventh. So he definitely would have been saying something if this is the angle that the sun is shining in the room. He definitely would have been saying something earlier. However, now. He's been, maybe they had a couple overcast days, and now he's actually got the first sunny morning, and it's shining right into the room. So that's why he says this, because they just got to this island. So that's how new uh, the Brodies are to the island, and that's how new we're looking at the relationship going on between Hendrix, Chief Brody, and Polly. That, that this, is very, this is within a week. It, it, it's within a week. It has to be. It has to be. That's the only other way to explain that line of dialogue. 
So back to Polly. We can make this a three-hour episode if we're going to talk about the Amity Police Department because I have so many details that I would like to establish. But also, there's a lot. There are many other clues in Jaws to talk about the police department. So that we're going to have to make that its own separate episode. But let's stick to Polly here. Her next line is. All right. Yes, Chief. Now we got a bunch of calls about that karate school. It seems that the nine-year-olds from the school have been karateing the picket fences. All right. So karateing the picket fences. Great line. Great delivery. Let's look at what's going on here. She said the nine-year-olds from the school have been karateing the picket fences. We had a we had a bunch of calls, right? Is that what she says? Yes, Chief. Now we got a bunch of calls about that karate school. It seems that the nine-year-olds from the school have been karateing the picket fences. So a bunch of calls from that karate school. So what it sounds like is that karate school just opened up, as in just opened up not a week or two weeks ago. So the the island is growing. The population is growing. Now, a karate school in your town, that is kind of a... Um, that is a very specific type of school that needs a clientele. Now, that I don't believe that would have existed unless the town is actually growing. So this karate school has not been around for a long time. Why? Because if the nine-year-olds are undisciplined, this has to be some sort of not a very good sensei or leader of the karate school because he's losing the discipline side of the karate lessons on the younger kids. And they're going out and uh, using their skills to destroy pro- to destroy property. So this can't be a, a long time school because they would have had these problems before. So the way Polly talks about this school tells me that it's brand new, and that lets me know is that Amity is actually growing. As in, now they have a police department. Now there's a karate school. There's a lot of there are a lot of new elements coming into the town where people are going to want to talk about red zones and parking areas. And he's gonna there's going to be more there are going to be more complaints than ever because now Mayor Vaughn's tourist season is in full swing, but things are are expanding. Things have expanded a lot larger than Amity has ever seen them before, including Polly. So that's why that karate school is brand new, and these are brand new, brand new complaints. The nine-year-olds are karate and picket fences. Now, she would have said, oh, th- this happens every, every spring when new students take over, right? And this is not a Cobra Kai uh, karate kid type dojo that's been established there for many years. No, this is brand new. And that's very interesting. That's a very interesting takeaway from the karate and picket fences. Uh, there's a lot more information that I have about the karate and picket fences. So if you go back and listen to episode 30, Billboard Vandals Caught, we have some good hard evidence on we know who's karate and the picket fences. So that means the community is growing and it's not a community of tourists. This is a community of islanders. Full-time residents are growing that can necessitate the establishment of a karate school. That's, that's, so that means there's a significant population growth that just happened. And that's where the, that's why that's an important line here. Chief Brody's office, the medical inspector. Now, one of the uh, aspects of this little moment, uh, Rob from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, wrote in, and he said that uh, he thought it was very, he wants to know how she answered it in under half a second. How did Polly know it was the medical examiner in under half a second when he called the chief? I think it's because that she already talked. She already fielded a few calls from the medical examiner earlier and uh, it, it, in coordinating when what was the was, was the recovery of the uh, remains of Chrissy Watkins right now this is a, a routine call this isn't um this isn't a one where he wants to strike up small conversation it's possible also that the medical examiner knows Polly's kind of a talker and that if he gets going or if he greets her in a non uh, in a full capacity that maybe she'll ask him more questions or maybe she will ask him uh, other details and he does not want to share any details or he doesn't want to make any small talk. 
So he just goes right into just uh, his title, and then she passes the phone off. But let's try that. Let's try. I will be the med- We know the medical examiner is Dr. Nevin. Dr. Nevin was a real doctor in Edgartown during that time that they cast as the doctor. So we're calling him Dr. Nevin. So let's see if we can, let's see if this matches up. I will be Dr. Nevin, and let's have, uh, let's have Polly answer the phone again. Karate in the picket fences. Dr. Nevin, Polly. So that kind of works. That kind of fits. I, in fact, I'll drop the Polly. Let's try it again. Karate in the picket fences. Chief Brody's office. Dr. Nevin. Medical inspector. So that works. So it really is just a run of the mill, but it's possible that Polly has already fielded a few phone calls because this is not her first time in the office. Remember, she has already been in this office for two hours, right? Between eight and 10. She stepped out really quick to go. I Maybe she stepped out to go talk to the fire chief, as you will see in the next line of dialogue. Because what she's doing now is he's talking to the medical examiner and he's typing in shark attack. She's writing on, she's crossing off on her little notepad. She's crossing off that. She already t- addressed the, she already told chief about the karate and the picket fences, the complaints from the karate in school. So that's what she's doing on her notepad right now. Yeah. So he goes and types shark attack. She's still writing. Now the fire chief wants you to go over the 4th of Polly, July. Polly, I want a list of all the water activities that the city fathers are planning for today, all right? Right away. Hendrix. Now Chief Brody talks over Polly there, but let's let's pay attention to exactly what she says there. Now the fire chief wants you to go over the 4th of Polly, July. Polly, I want a list of all the water activities that the city fathers are planning for today, all right? I have that listed off. She says, now the fire chief wants you to go over the 4th of July signs with him for the waterfront. Now the fire chief wants you to go over the 4th of Polly, July. Polly, I want a list of all the water activities the that the city fathers are planning for today, all right? So that's very interesting. As, he, as she realizes Chief Brody's cutting her off, that's the second part on her list. So it's possible that the... Um, There's two things, two aspects here, is that Polly left the office to go talk to the fire chief and wrote the second point, the second note down on her notepad, came back. She's relaying that information to Chief Brody. But what also shows is that this is, what is it, what are we talking about? This is Chief Brody's, this is the first time coordination with Chief Brody and the fire chief about signs along the waterfront for the 4th of July. Very interesting. So uh, as we know on the sign that's over the Amity Town Square where Martin Brody crosses the road, it says the 50th annual regatta. So Amity has been around for over 50 years as a township. Okay, so if there was a prior police department set up and a prior police chief that was working, there would already be signs there, okay? There would already be signs for what the 4th of July and all the chaos that's going to come onto the island. There would already be an established protocol. But right now, because the fire chief wants to go over the signs for the waterfront with Chief Brody, that's brand new. So this is all new coordination going on, new signage, new crowd control procedures are being established on Amity because that's how new we are looking at the Amity Police Department starting up. So Martin Brody has a lot of all these logistics and all this, all sorts of um, procedural work to do in establishing boundaries, roadways, and signage for the different for for the for the population boom that's going to be happening and the fire chief wants to meet with him on that this isn't a prior established procedure her line right there is that she went over to meet with the fire chief she's coming back now it's now almost 11 and she's telling him that the fire chief wants to meet but he's seeing shark attack and he's going we got to get those signs this is very interesting too you to go over the fourth of Polly, July. I want a list of all the water activities that the water city water fathers are planning for today, all right? Right away. Hendrix. Says, Polly, I want to have a list of all the water activities that the city fathers are planning for today. The city fathers, he must be talking about the selectmen, only he doesn't have the verbiage right. Uh, he must be, that's what he's talking about. It's got to be the selectmen that he has are planning for today. All the list of water activities that they have planning for today. And she says right away, 
as in it's going. she's going to have to run around and find out what's going on. Uh, but he, uh, Chief Brody says city fathers. It's very interesting. I believe he means selectmen. Uh, a city father, if you look that up, um, a city father is a not, in the American Heritage Dictionary. A city father, noun, is a municipal official such as a council member, a senior municipal official, especially elected officials such as a mayor, a controller, or a municipal legislator. So the city fathers is another name for the town selectmen. Not necessarily that Amity is a city. That's just it's just a term that Chief Brody's using, that he's talking about the selectmen. And what so what he's saying is uh, what plan what do they have planned for today? Waterfront activities, do they have planned? Do the do the selectmen have planned? He's using the term city fathers. Very interesting stuff going on here, just with the exchange with Polly. Now, that's going to be the last time we see Polly. I don't want to get too much more into the history of Amity Police Department. We'll save that for another episode. But that's very interesting that she can bring these type of details to the movie in just a few lines of dialogue. For today, all right? Right away. Hendrix. Hey, Chief. Where do we keep the beach clothes Chief. signs? Chief. We never oh, had any. No. Chief. There's a damn truck with a Hampshire place on it smack in front of my store. So the next time Polly's name is brought up is right here. Chief! Chief! Polly sent me to find you to tell you that there's a bunch of Boy Scouts out in April Bay doing their mile swim for their merit badges. I couldn't call them in. There's no phones out there. Okay. Come on. Get out of there. Take this stuff back to the office and get to work on those signs. All right. Beach is closed. No swimming. Well, let's take that look right there. He said... Chief! Polly sent me to find you to tell you that there's a bunch of Boy Scouts out in April Bay doing their mile swim for their merit badges. Okay, so he says, Polly sent me to find you. So Polly actually has some uh, administrative jurist. Uh, uh, her, she's an administrative official, but she has some sort of, that she has some sway where she's like, you got to go find Chief and tell him. So Polly actually got on the phone really fast, and she found out that the Boy Scouts are doing their mile swim for their merit badges on Avril Bay. So here comes Deputy Hendricks to go find Chief Brody. So Polly actually got on the phone and she sent Deputy Hendricks out. So that's how fast she can work those phones, that Polly. She's extremely efficient at what she does, and she probably knows the right people to call and who to talk to when just to get some information out there. But then Polly's brought up one more time in this conversation. I couldn't call him in. There's no phones out there. Okay, come on, get out of there. Take this stuff back to the office and get to work on those signs. Right. Beach is closed. No swimming. By order of the Amity PD. Let Polly do the printing. What's the matter with my friend? Let Polly do the printing. Hey, Chief. Chief Brody! So Chief Brody's now saying, we need signs, beach is closed, no swimming, by order of the Amity PD, let Polly do the printing. And then uh, and, and Hendricks wants to know, what's the matter with my printing? And he says, let Polly do the printing. So what happened here is that Chief must have had some sort of project in the last few days, okay? This isn't like within the week. This might be even the first work week that Chief Brody had. We're talking, this is Friday. So Monday, they were putting up signage. They were making signs. And Chief Brody must have learned that Hendricks had terrible penmanship or he did not have great spelling or maybe he messed a few signs up. So he said, no, let Polly do the printing because he saw that Polly can actually, uh, she has nice penmanship with a paintbrush. Uh, She makes professional signs. So I looked back and I said, what possibly is the sign that Chief Brody learned that Polly, let Polly do the printing? So if you go back and you quickly look at this part. We never had any. No. There's a damn truck with a Hampshire place on it smack in front of my store. Just have him fill out the form. Just fill it out. The dead truck with New Hampshire plates in front of his store as Chief Brody is exiting the Amity Police Department. Just fill it out. Yeah, so right there as he's walking out, there is a sign that says Amity Police Department. And it's printed with nice penmanship in those block letters, just like Polly can do. Is it possible that one of the first jobs Chief Brody tasked Deputy Hendricks to do is make an Amity Police Department sign and signage for the building and he screwed up the spelling or he used all the black paint 
and he couldn't get it right. And then Holly came in and she knocked it out of the park in one shot and made the perfect sign. So that's why Chief Brody is bringing that up. Beach is closed. No swimming. By order of the Amity PD. And let Polly do the printing. What's the matter with my friend? Let Polly do the printing. Thank you. So is that possible that that's what happened? Very is it, it very much is possible because we are establishing that this is a brand new organization that's being set up and we are watching the formation of, we are watching the town of Amity actually grow its footprint out. The organizational flowchart is growing. You have the mayor's office, now you have the chief of police. All these different, these different columns are being set up to grow the population. Very interesting stuff. So let Polly do the printing. So Polly is in charge. So that's when we see those signs later on, beaches closed, no swimming by order of the Amity PD. She's got the nice block lettering there. She uses some fancy script by order of the Amity and then by order of the Amity PD. There's a, there's a nice little fancy script there. So Polly is, uh, brings a, uh, a seasoned veteran status, an island veteran status to uh, Chief Brody's operation. It also is possible that Polly was in the town hall. So she has established channels with the mayor and all the other selectmen. So there's things that are going on where that everybody's kind of, all the information is kind of passed around. Never underestimate the influence and the technical savviness that is Polly, that Polly brings to the uh, Amity PD operation on Amity Island. Chief Brody is relying on her just as much as he's relying on his very own deputy, Deputy Hendricks. Much more that we can get into in later episodes about the Amity Police Department, but for now, I think that we've answered those questions about Polly. Why did she answer the phone so fast? Because it wasn't her first time in the office on that fateful Friday, June 27th, 1974, when the events of Jaws started. Thank you very much for listening. This has been episode 63. Let Polly do the printing. Show me the way to go. I'm tired. Special thanks to Hayden Wheeler for coming on the show to explain what it will be a great event on July 1st, novel celebration for Robert Shaw with the Book of Quint. Thanks to Chris and Kimberly for the promotional work that's going on over there. Very exciting times. The movie Jaws is copyright property of Universal Studios. Any references and sampling from the movie Jaws in this episode is intended to fall within Section 107 of the Copyright Act. The copyrighted materials are fairly used for the purposes of criticism, criticism, comment, reporting, teaching, and research. The materials used here are protected by the Fair Use Guidelines of Section 107 of the Copyright Act, all rights reserved to the copyright owners. a little bit of a punch list uh, to do here to get things ready for the big trip. I'll be flying out on Thursday and the next time I talk to the Jaws fans will be from UK time. Very exciting to see things happen. Please go to our show notes for links. You can find the links in the description of this broadcast for the Eventbrite and for the address to the Robert Shaw Weatherspoon Pub in West Houghton. We're on July 1st at 11 a.m. It's going to be exciting times. So I will be talking to you not next weekend, but the weekend after that with a show and updates on the event. Until then, thanks for listening. Until then, farewell and adieu and show me the way to go home. Mm -hmm.